welcome all to this fifth seminar, uh, webinar in the series uh, of the Zapatista Journey for Life. My name is Mercedes and I'll be chairing this session. And before we begin, I would like to just briefly mention the situation in Chiapas. I don't know if you attended um, the last session. You might remember Ruby mentioning the murder of Simon Perez of Las Abejas Actual and a member of the CNE. Uh, he had recently denounced the situation lived in Pantelo in Chiapas at the hands of the narco paramilitary groups. And then after this, uh, the murder of Simon, a uh, self-defense group of Pantelo confronted the narco paramilitary and this led to an escalation of the conflict with the presence of the Mexican army, the Guardia Nacional, and the conflict has led to, uh, to the displacement of over 2,000 from Chenalo and and yeah, the situation is critical and so I thought it would be good to mention it here. And I can put again the link in the chat in case any of you want to read more about this. There it is. And yeah, so coming back to the journey for life, I would like to thank all of you for your contributions to this webinar and to the crowdfunder, which is now closed and we passed both the original target and the stretch target. And we are truly grateful for all your contributions and also your participation in this webinar series. Yes, it, it, it was a very good news to have today. Um, for this uh, session, we will continue the structure from the previous ones, a 20 minute presentation followed by a Q&A and a discussion. The topic for today's session is the SZLN in international politics, a crucial aspect of Zapatismo, particularly at this moment embodied in the journey for life. And we'll be discussing what other types of worlds and politics ensue from the Zapatista struggle and its effect in international resistance and politics crossed by art and poetics as well as solidarity, which was a pending question and discussion from the previous webinar. Um, I think this session is going to be wonderful and can create a very fruitful discussion. And if you have any type of question or comment, you can type that into the chat and we'll come back to them during the Q&A and discussion. The order for our speakers today uh, is going to be Oscar, Brad and Anthony. And just as a reminder for our speakers, the presentations are 20 minutes. And perhaps perhaps I can unmute myself and let you know when you have two or three minutes left. Would that be fine? Okay. And our first presentation is by Professor Oscar Guardiola Rivera, who I think might need to leave a bit earlier because it's his birthday, right? Happy birthday, Oscar. Thank you. Um, Oscar Guardiola Rivera is a professor of human rights and political philosophy and deputy PGT director in the Department of Law at Birkbeck University of London. Oscar has published, published widely on Latin American politics and is the author of two critically acclaimed books, What If Latin America Ruled the World and A Story of a Death Foretold. More recently, he has published In Defense of Armed Art Struggle, A Future for the Philosophy of Liberation in the Colonizing Ethics, and the poetic novel, Night of the World. Over to you. Buenos dias, uh, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, muy bienvenidos, uh, los hermanos y las hermanas de Chiapas. What I'm going to uh, do today to celebrate the forging of an alliance between uh, uh, the Zapatista movement for liberation and uh, the many movements and many of us who also struggle for liberation here and elsewhere is to read uh, or share with you three tales. These are three tales on resistance or more precisely on pockets of resistance. First tale on pockets of resistance. In 1942, an Aztec sailor named Notli Europsin Texpoca 
departed from the port of Minatitlan with a small flotilla of wooden rafts. Three months later, he discovered a new continent and named it Europsin after himself. In November 1512, the omnipotent Aztecs began the conquest of Europsin in the name of thy father Tezcatlipoca, lord of cross-cultural misunderstandings. Y entonces el desmadre se comenzó a multiplicar logo rhythmically and logo arithmeticamente. It's an extract from Guillermo Gomez Peña's Codex Spangliensis. Second tale on pockets of resistance. Marcos, I want to say something about a pocket of resistance. Thus begins the third letter exchanged between Subcomandante Insurgente Marcos and the British art critic John Berger. In the, close, in the closing of the 20th century and the opening of this one, Marcos and Berger sent each other many long letters. If you include the one Marcos had published throughout the world press in August 1997, notably in the Parisian issue of Le Monde Diplomatique. In that first letter, Marcos prophesizes the coming of a fourth world war. The third was the so-called Cold War, which in the lands of our childhood in the Americas was everything but cold. The aim of the belligerents is the conquest of the entire world through the market, explains Berger, citing Marcos's letter. The arsenals are financial. There are nevertheless millions of people being maimed or killed every moment. The aim of those waging the war is to rule the world from new abstract power centers, megalopolises of the market, which will be subject to no control except that of the logic of investment. Meanwhile, nine-tenths of the women and men living on the planet leave with the jagged pieces that do not fit. As you know, the prophecy has now come to pass. As I write these, I receive news of yet another social leader, another anti-ecocide activist, another member of the first line of the general strike assassinated in the Americas, in Colombia, this time. In the last 78 days since the start of the Paro Nacional, the general strike in Colombia, at least 43 people have been murdered by police or the armed forces of the para state and 346 have been disappeared or gone missing. In 2018, the Centro Nacional de la Memoria Histórica, the Colombian National Center for Historical Memory, established in its report on forced disappearances that between 1970 and 2018, some 80 thousand people, let me repeat that, 80,000 people had gone missing. That is more, many more people than those missing during the years of the military juntas, if you combined all the dictatorships of the southern cone. That is the result of the fourth world war that Marcos prophesied in one country alone, a country that at least nominally has never been under a dictatorship and is often referred to in the media as one of the oldest and most stable democracies in the Americas. These are the women and men caught between being and non-being who live and die or not yet with the jagged pieces that do not fit. In the state of space-time indeterminacy that Marcos illuminated in his letter, and Berger compared to the jaggedness of Hieronymus Bosch's millennium triptych, painted around the same time that the omnipotent Aztec began the conquest of Europe seen. But of course, that did not happen. The prophecy of Europe seen is a puzzle, and as such, it must be read in reverse, reinvented. What did happen is what Bosch prophesied over 500 years ago when he depicted hell in the right-hand panel of his triptych. This hell has become a strange prophecy of the mental climate imposed on the world at the end of the last century and the beginning of ours by globalization and the new economic order, Berger says. As he observes, Bosch's symbols 
likely came through the subterranean proverbial heretical language of 15th and 16th century strands who believed that if evil could be overcome, it was possible to build heaven on earth. The political philosophy that subterranean current flowing underground into the bodies of the disappeared and the bodies of those who have come literally from the other side of the ocean and from beneath the earth to occupy the streets of our cities and demonstrate, if only momentarily, is known as the neo-Aristotelian left. But for those of us who were born on the other side of the ocean under the earth during the time of the apotheosis of war, or those who, like Berger and Marco, see the planet today as a jagged battlefield or a disassembled fossil in need of reinvention, a more fitting image is that of a pocket, like a pocket universe, struggling to break through the spaces in between the jagged pieces of the hell world created by the new economic order prophesized by Bosch's depiction in the third panel, which do not fit. A pocket universe of many worlds, a world of many worlds. Yet if Bosch's vision of hell is prophetic, the prophecy is not in the grotesque details, but in the whole, or to put it another way, in what constitutes the space of hell. There is no horizon there. There is no continuity between actions. There are no pauses, no paths, no pattern, no past, and no future. There is only the clamor of the disparate, fragmentary present. Everywhere there are surprises and sensations, yet nowhere is there any outcome. Nothing flows through. Everything interrupts, writes Berger to Marcus. We are falling, but it feels as if we were floating or not moving at all. If there is nothing to fall towards, no ground, we may not even be aware that we are falling. All planets and societies may be falling around us just as we are, but it feels like perfect spaces. Compare this space to what one sees in the average publicity slot or in a typical CNN news bulletin or in any media mass, mass media comment, commentary, Berger tells Marcos and the readers, and you will see that Bosch prophesied what is the world picture communicated to us today by the media under the impact of the globalization of a late settler colonial condition with its delinquent need to sell incessantly and therefore to dispose of producer peoples incessantly. Bose's prophecy and today's world picture are like a puzzle whose wretched pieces do not fit together. And that is precisely the term that Su Comandante Marcos used in his letter, writing from Chiapas, Southeast Mexico in the Americas, to speak of the lived experience of the women and men living in a stasis between being and non-being. In the old years of the Cold War, a word was invented to refer to them, los desaparecidos, the missing, but the word has proven insufficient and indeterminate. In our time, the institutions that drive the fourth world war have learned how to play with that indeterminacy as if a choice of weapons. The Colombian and the Mexican states, for instance, prefer the term persona no localizada, non-localized person. So far, no one knows the whys and wherefores of such language, of such term, but it is noticeable that it helps the state circumvent the laws they themselves signed up to and promised to protect, to keep secret their acts of massacre and disappearance. Thus, this points towards another jagged piece of the puzzle. The failure of language in the age of the Fourth World War and derivative finance. Marcus and the Zapatistas have spoken of seven pieces. The first has a dollar sign on it and is green. The second is triangular and consists of a lie. The new order claims to rationalize and modernize in the name of science or governance by numbers. In fact, it is an attempt to sustain the reign of terror by recreating the system of the unipolar and homogeneous group that was the drive of settler colonization in the first place. It has the shape of the pyramid printed on the back of the US dollar bill, at the top of which hovers the eye of the law. The third is round like a vicious circle or like purgatory. 
It includes those of us forced into exile, emigration, and into the hostile environment that flashed visible during the weekend of the 2021 Football Eurocup final here in Britain. This is what connects the events of happening in places as different and far apart as Australia, Gaza, London, Chiapas, Cali, or Bogota. The immigrants, the landless, the, na the natives, the youth, were all treated as waste matter to be cleansed. Limpieza in Spanish. The fourth piece is a mirror-like rectangle. The exchange between commercial banks, drug dealers, racketeers, ventures, venture capitalists, and politicians. For what used to be globalized crime is now the mirror of production and good society, la gente de bien, as they say in Spanish. The fifth is a pentagon. The sixth is the shape of a scribble that looks like a collage or a concrete poem. The fragmentation and multiple division of borders and the raising of walls like a world of broken mirrors. The seventh has the shape of a pocket. We have added the failure of language, which is also the language of failure. The pieces will never fit nor make sense. This lack of sense is the effect of the time, of our time, a generalized and eternal look at pessimum, a claustrophobia and pessimism that at its most extreme becomes the highest point of defeatism. It is not caused by overcrowding, the use of masks, which we learn from Supamaros and Zapatistas and has become handy during the years of plague or prolonged you know, viral lockdowns, but by the lack of any continuity between one action and the next. It is this that is hell. The seemingly inconsequential nature of our demonstrations and our actions. In today's culture, as in Bosch's hell, there is no glimpse of an elsewhere or an otherwise. Thus, if we are to build a new world, a pocket world, capable of containing many worlds, capable of containing all worlds, as Marcos says at the end of his first letter, then the first step is to refuse the world picture implanted in our minds and all the promises used everywhere to justify the disposal of peoples, the reign of terror that this world needs to maintain in order to continue feeding our insatiable thirst for all the things it needs to sell. Not only another space is necessary as the JSS, such as the one that the Zapatistas have built in Southern Chiapas, but also another time. And that is why we're here today, to build a new alliance, to build a new memory, to avenge and to build a new future. One that includes not only us and our resistant dead, but also the birds, the heron and the eagle, the forest which appear in the correspondence between Marcos and Berger and the stones in the forest. Third and final tale on pockets of resistance. A small boy is asleep in his room. On the bedside table, there is a glass of milk. During the night, a mouse climbs on the table and drinks the milk. When the boy wakes up, he finds the glass empty and begins to cry. He does not stop. Neither the pleas of his mother nor the punishments of his father make him stop. Child services are cold. Even the police for the neighbors feared something was wrong and decided to intervene out of the goodness of their humanitarian hearts. But the boy would not stop. So the mouse goes to that goat, to the goat, asks for some milk. But the goat has no milk because there is no grass. The mouse goes to the field, but the field has no grass. The drought season is now longer than it used to be, and the field is too parched. The mouse goes to the well, and the well has no water because it hasn't rained and it needs repairing. The mouse is no shaman, no dancer. He does not know how to dance like the heron and the eagle, and therefore knows not how to bring the rain, but at least you can go to the mason and ask him to repair the well, but the mason does not have the proper stones. Then the mouse climbs the mountain, and the mountain has grown deaf. It wants to hear nothing, for he has lost its trees, and the men keep coming to take the stones. It now looks like a skeleton. In exchange for your stones, says the mouse to the mountain, 
The boy, when he grows up, will plant trees on your slopes. But the mountain replies it no longer believes in the promises of men. But this is a boy, says the mouse. Children love gifts, not false promises. They also love secrets. Above all, they love to reveal them, to extend them. They tell it like it really is. Whereupon the mountain agrees to give the stones. Later, the boy has so much milk, he bathes in it. Later still, when he becomes a man, he plants the trees, sending the secret for the buried treasure therein. The erosion stops, and the land becomes fertile again. Postscriptum. This tale, the final tale, appears in the final letter between Marcos and Berger. It is a tale of children. Children realize the presence of the taboo, the rules of exchange and contract in breaking it. They can be said to love secrets so much as to spend them in profitless laws, like poets, like wordsmiths, like palabreros. They believe in hope rather than promises, and hope is, as the correspondence of our letters say, a long affair. Stones propose precisely that other sense of time, one whereby the past, the deep, living and ongoing past of the planet and our resistant dead, proffers a meager yet massive support to human acts of resistance, as if the veins of metal in the rock, the lead and heavy metals that reigned during the time of the apotheosis of war in the lands of our childhood, led to our veins of blood. To place a stone upright so that it stands vertical is not only an act of symbolic recognition, but also one that tells it like it is, the real. The stone becomes a presence, a dialogue begins. This is why we are here today. Nothing rough or jagged has been left. And the tools we use are not only words, but obsidian. The time space is corporeal, in that it seems to pulse like an organ in a body. A dialogue begins. It matters less to ask our Zapatista brothers and sisters where they come from. More interesting is where they are heading. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Oscar. It's, wow, this very rich presentation that has so many threads to pull from. It's amazing. Uh, yes, I was just reading a book and I, this led me to a quotation that says, sometimes only by fiction can we approach the, the true lo verdadero. No? And this third uh, story, it's just that. And going back to that, it's a, for these appearances, it's impressive how language has actually not varied that much because we can go back to um, Videla in Argentina saying that the desaparecidos are just that and a question mark that they are neither here nor there so they should be treated like an incognita and then just recently in Mexico we find uh, the mother scene Tamaulipas found half a ton of calcinated bones it's just mass mass graves everywhere so yeah Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, now, our next presentation is by Brad Evans. Professor Brad Evans is a political philosopher, critical theorist, and writer whose work specializes on the problem of violence. The author of 17 books and edited volumes, along with over 100 academic and media articles, he, he currently holds a chair in political violence and aesthetics at the University of Bath United Kingdom. Brad is founder, director of, his, of the Histories of Violence project. In this capacity, he has recently directed a global research initiative on the theme of disposable life to interrogate the meaning of mass violence in the 21st century. Welcome, Brad. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's great to actually, I think, follow on from what Oscar has to say. I think there's actually, I'm gonna start with art and then kind of arrive at a similar place in terms of the Fourth World War. So I think it's, hopefully there's a lot of commonalities and I'm sure Anthony will follow in that as well. I want to um, begin actually um, with, uh, if you kind of indulge me, I'm gonna actually read a short section from a book which I've just published called Ecce Humanitas, Beholding the Pain of Humanity which has a section which deals a bit with the Zapatistas. So I want to kind of read a bit from that. And it's a section which actually talks to the idea of subaltern expressionism. Now, the image that I have in my kind of background here is not incidental, and it's actually the image I want to start to talk about today. For those of you who don't know, this is uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's Julius Caesar on Gold. So I'll kind of start the talking on this and then arrive back to the Zapatistas and hopefully we can have a wider conversation later on the significance. And I will try to bring in some stuff on disappearance as well, just towards the end, uh, which I think is important as well. Okay, so Jean-Michel Basquiat's Julius Caesar on Gold is arguably the most politically subversive of all his works. The artist dealt with many political issues in his tragically short career, most notably police brutality, However, it is his provocative depiction of Julius Caesar as a black man that invokes a particularly heretic claim on the nature of sovereignty and how its form might be reimagined. The opulence and violence in this image are immediately apparent. Surrounded by yellow and gold background, the figure strikes a defiant and unapologetic pose. What would it mean to come face to face with legitimate black violence, he asks. But the dual being proposed here is duality itself. Nation, power, religion, identity, they're all being challenged as the naked black Caesar confrontationally casts aside the regalia of privilege, so apparent in usual depictions of royalty. Now, while the usual poetry that adorns Basquiat's works are absent from this piece, it nevertheless reveals his acute appreciation of the history of art and how it connects to dominant political ideals, along with his position as a poetic visionary. And I, I think this is a strong case we can make for Basquiat as being a poetic visionary. Basquiat's Caesar is a stark physical contrast to the world he occupies. He appears before us in a raw and unadulterated form, calm yet ready to inflict violence at any given moment. It's difficult to tell whether this figure, this Caesar, is a boy or a man. This only adds to the drama. What gives this figure the right to stand before us in such an audacious way? Did colonization not teach us that the surest way to domesticate populations is to reduce adults to children, to infantilize the other in order to render them as naturally inferior as children are to the patriarchal figure? This is compounded by the fact that Basquiat's Caesar is far from athletic, his body appearing more emaciated. This adds greater depth and historical resonance by exercising the wretched figure away from political idealism. There is no Orientalist sub seduction for the objectified black body at work here. Neither is there some romantic vision of a chis chiseled and sculpted warrior whose muscular and sexual prowess would ensure some glorious or beautiful death. To bear witness in his work, as Bell Hooks wrote, Basquiat struggled to utter the unspeakable. Prophetically called, he engaged in an extended artistic elaboration of the politics of dehumanization. In his work, the colonization of the black body and mind is marked by the anguish of abandonment, estrangement, dismemberment, and death. Even, or we might say especially, the Black Julius carries these visible marks. Now in Caesar's right hand, we see a sharpened knife, which looks more like a tribal dagger, whereas in his left hand, we see him holding what looks like a scepter. The parallels with Hobbes's Leviathan are striking. For God and country, religion and stately violence, protection and punishment, morality and its transgressions, the promise of peace and the reality of war are all brought together in sacred union as the sanctity of sacrifice is writ large. I'm reminded again there by Oscar's point about taboo, and that's maybe something we can explore in a bit. But this Leviathan king does not look down from on high. He is grounded, 
and his feet are visible as he walks on the surface of the earth. Here then the golden backdrop takes on a renewed meaning. It represents not the ordered civilized realm that has been cultivated, its forests tamed and cleared, but the unforgiving desert wilderness where life is in perpetual exile, where banished kings fight to reclaim their thrones, where everything is at stake. As Thomas McEnry writes, in Basquiat's Over, the theme of the divine or the royal exile was literally brought down to earth or historicized by the concrete reality of living in a diaspora. The king that he once was in another country could imagine, be imagined simply concrete. But I want to ask, who or what is even being sacrificed in this scene? Now, you might see to the above here there is the appearance of the letter M. What does this indicate in this appearance of violence? Might it not be that something that has been killed off is nothing, nothing other than the belief in the omnipotence of sovereignty? What might the letter M represent you? Is it Martin, Malcolm, Mahatma? Marcos, or even later Michel, who was also fated to an untimely death. This, I think, raises a whole number of important questions for me. And I think, personally, I, I'm, I'm not moving over here, but it certainly draws questions to me about what Gayatri Spivak talks about in terms of affirmative sabotage. Now, as Spivak writes in terms of affirmative sabotage, and I, I'm taking uh, in, the, in this uh, section of the book, um, reworking Spivak's work in terms of this idea of what I think Basquiat represents as a form of subaltern expressionism. And this is a quote from uh, Spivak from an interview I actually gave with her. Um, she says, affirmative sabotage doesn't just ruin. The idea is of entering the discourse that you are criticizing fully so that you can turn it around from inside. The only real and effective way you can sabotage something this way is when you are working intimately within it. This is particularly the case with imperial intellectual tools, which have been developed not just upon the shoulders, but upon the backs of people for centuries. Hooks would no doubt be in agreement. To return to her article on the importance of Basquiat's work, she draws parallels with James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which she explained, declared that for the horrors of black life, there has to almost be no language. This resonates with Lewis Gordon's claim on the decolonial nature of art and how its transgressive witnessing relates to historical oppression. Gordon explains, colonialism and other forms of oppression are human practices through which human institutions of violence are constructed and maintained. What this means is that they could never be complete. They are attempts as idols and expressions of idolatry to close human reality through reducing it to one of its elements. In the case of racism, that means the narcissism as we have seen over the past few hundred years of white supremacy. The obvious limitations of all such efforts are that those, even those built who built them eventually find them unlivable and seek alternatives even from those they are supposedly conquered. Colonized people fight and part of their resistance is in their effort to reclaim their value, often through producing art that transcends those idols imposed upon them. Colonial art eventually suffers the fate of all those who imagine they are at the end of heart, the end of history and the end of thought. We are taken back to Foucault's concern here with subjugated knowledges and forms of production denied by regulatory powers of the image thought police. Around the same time as Bastiat was painting his Caesar, Foucault was being interviewed for the French newspaper Le Mot Diplomatique under conditions of anonymity. His reasons for concealing his identity were rather straightforward. He wanted the readers who encountered his work to be judged on the basis of the content alone. Anonymity was his way of addressing the potential reader, as Foucault said, out of a time for a nostalgia when being quite unknown meant I had the chance of actually being heard, without framing the work as having knowing who I am. 
writing as the, in the name of the interview as the masked philosopher, allowed Foucault the luxury of a more intense thought, what he referred to as the lightning that could strike. And I'd like to just give this brief quote from Foucault's interview, because I think this is actually the most poetic passage Foucault ever wrote. And he says, I can't help but dream about a kind of criticism that would not try to judge, but bring about an over, a book, a sentence, an idea to life. It would light fires, watch the grass grow, listen to the wind, catch the sea foam in the breeze and scatter it. It would multiply not judgments, but signs of existence. It would summon them, drag them from their sleep. Perhaps it would invent them, all the better, all the better. Criticism that hands down sentences sends me to sleep. I'd like criticism of scintillating leaps of the imagination. It would not be a sovereign or dressed in red. It would bear the lightning of all possible storms. Some four years later, as Mexico was still coming to terms with the devastating aftermath of the brutal earthquake that ravaged its capital cities and fully revealed the corruption of the regime, a student named Rafael Sebastian Gullien made the trip to Chiapas, Mexico. He would later assume the name Subcomandante Marcos the spokesperson for the Zapatistas, who became the very first organization to openly declare war on an internationally recognized agreement. The Zapatistas broke new ground in terms of the way they connected indigeneity with the politics of difference, that setting aside any of the colonial dialectics which once haunted leftist thinking, made non-violence possible in a land that had only ever known the subjugation, massacre, and the genocide of the indigenous. Moreover, Marcos captured the popular imagination with his grammatical interventions, presenting art, aesthetics, and theater as integral elements of the revolutionary struggle. Thus Marcos, another masked philosopher, I would say somebody who was fully in line with the very ideal which Foucault was trying to achieve but never managed to do himself, would emerge as one of the most important critical thinkers of the late 20th century, and we might argue continues to do so today. And while the local fight for the rights of indigenous peoples has certainly been influential, his critical importance, and this is what I have always taken from the writings of Marcos, lay in his poetic ability to develop new ways for thinking and writing about politics in the world, which are also defined by their subalternity and creative expressionism. Marcos would show in powerful ways the importance of fabulation and the need to develop a new conceptual vocabulary to break away from the dogmatism of political science. As he explained in one of his many provocative writings, I want to read this passage out which I think really captures the politics of the Zapatistas in general. Scientists, political scientists, opinion leaders, chiefs of great and small political sects, all have gathered round Newton's fallen apple. All of them analyze, discuss, corroborate. Hours, days, weeks, months, entire years they take up. Finally, they come to one irrefutable conclusion. The apple has fallen because the law of gravity so orders it. It is the irredeemable, the apple must fall, and by doing so, it has done nothing other than to subject itself to the law of gravity. The political scientists congratulate each other and then begin great essays in order to show that Newton's apple as an example of real politics at work. The chiefs of state talk of erecting a multiple monument in all the places of power dedicated to the apple. But while the scientists are making complicated calculations concerning velocity, trajectory, much weight, acceleration, wind resistance, impact, and similar etc. And while the political scientists are all busy rewriting Machiavelli and discussing prices with modern princesses and princes, sorry, the Zapatista approaches the apple, he looks at it, he smells it, he touches it, he listens to it. The Zapatista understands what the apple is whispering in his ear. He understands the challenge demanded by its cry. The apple says that fate does not order it to fall to the ground. And since it is the transgressor of the law, 
who is listening to it. It is all about breaking the law of gravity. This apple that Newton has changed to the ground has another destiny. The moon is an apple. The scales of history need two apples in order to be able to look out at the morning clearly. The political scientists continue to re repeating and repeating to each other, the real politic and the etceteras that already fill the magazines and newspapers and the radio and the television airtime. The Zapatista continues making calculations. To fall upward, that is the mystery whose solution has been proposed. Now, having written numerous inventive tales in conversation with fictional or deceased characters, Marcos would also write a number of original theses on global power and violence, none more so compelling than the Fourth World War. In this treaty, Marcos asks, who is the enemy? His response is straightforward. We are saying that humanity is now the enemy. The Fourth World War is destroying humanity as globalization is universalized in the market and everything human which opposes the logic of the market is an enemy which must be destroyed. In this sense, we are all the enemy to be vanquished, indigenous, non-indigenous, human rights observers, teachers, intellectuals, artists. This war on difference, as Marcos explained, was a war against those who dared to think and imagine differently. It was a war against humanity in its most affirmative and ex freely expressive sense. Even those strategists would soon learn to appropriate those very terms of engagement in order to justify violence in humanity's name. I'm just thinking of the war on terror as the obvious example. And so what was at stake here and what is at stake here is more than just a fight for the indigenous of Mexico to have autonomy and the right to have rights, to echo Edward Said. It's about the ability to express ourselves and themselves to make a claim to be part of this world. Not for enrichment or for a retreat into crude notions of identity, whether they be the rightful heirs of the nation or some contested claim about who is the most persecuted people of history, but to poetically affirm their own subjectivity while acting as a watch person to the violence of history. It was not to lament and certainly not to fall back into some dialectic of representational purity, but to insist that another image of the world is possible in a creative response to the image of the world that continues to annihilate. I will end it there. Thank you so much. It was, again, a wonderful presentation and the way you worked through all the, from the beginning from Basquiat to Foucault to the mask to another image of the world, it was just, I have so many questions. <laughs> I think we can go, uh, yeah, we have time, but yeah, I'll just present Anthony. Um, Anthony Parmeli is a lecturer in visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London and a recovery and group work program consultant. Anthony's research and writing is concerned with a psychosocial analysis of political and social movements with an often focus on issues of coloniality and resistance as understood in both politics and psychoanalysis. Anthony is an author of Resistance, Revolution and Fascism, Zapatismo and Assemblage Politics. He is currently completing a book on digital media and the extreme right tentatively titled The Mass Psychology of Fascism in the Age of Machines, Big Data, Surveillance and Control. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. Um, maybe before I get started, I can say that I noticed in the chat that some people were, were commenting on the, the general kind of youthfulness of, of the crowd here today. And whilst I'm not sure if I can really honestly call myself young, um, I, I can say that in 94, when, when the uprising happened, I, I was living just at the U.S.-Mexican border, um, a little bit north of the border. So I, I was 13 in the uprising. So in a lot of ways, a lot of my understanding of politics has always been informed by Marcos. You know, I, I remember waking up that morning and seeing the news of it. So I should say it's always a bit strange to speak at an event that you've also organized, especially since I actually kind of came in as a ringer after another presentation um, presenter had a scheduling conflict. 
It's also very daunting to follow um, both Oscar and Brad, both of whom have inspired my thought for some years now. Um, but I'm really excited to share my thoughts with you and I look forward to the discussion we can have later. So what I wanna talk about today, it's a little bit different. Um, and it's gonna draw on that book I published a few years ago about resistance, uh, which was heavily informed by Zapatismo. I should say though, as Mercedes already kind of signaled, that my writing is very much at the intersection of psychosocial studies and political philosophy. So I tend to write in a fairly kind of occult language. Um, so the concept I'm gonna talk about today is this notion of assemblage politics, but I'm gonna to try to say it, you know, kind of speak about it in a more accessible way than I usually do without using the crutch of kind of academic jargon. But if I do slip into kind of academic ease, um, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and, and ask me to go back and explain something. So I want to begin by framing my talk around a question that Les actually raised um, during a discussion last week that I think is really at the heart of any resistance movement. So in the, in the conversation, for those of you who are there, Les asked us the very kind of deceptively difficult question, what do we mean by solidarity? He then offered a definition that solidarity is not helping someone, but being willing to learn with them. Now, something about his definition of solidarity kind of really stuck with me. On one hand, I implicitly agree with it, but at the same time, I feel like it needs a little bit more nuance, um, at least in relation to the Zapatista resistance. So I wanted to spend just a bit of time today thinking about what does Zapatista solidarity look like and how can it inform resistances elsewhere? The definition of solidarity that Les gave us immediately reminded me of a letter that Subcomandante Marcos wrote um, addressed to civil society in April of 94. The letter read in part, I'm quoting here, we are not reproaching you for anything to those from civil society who came to the communities. We know that you are risking much to come and see us and to bring aid to the civilians in this side. It is not that our needs which bring us pain, it's seeing in others what others don't see, the same abandonment of liberty and democracy, the same lack of justice. From what our people received and benefit in this war, I saved as an example of humanitarian aid from the Chiapencio indigenous, which arrived a few weeks ago. A pink stiletto heel imported, size six and a half without its mate. I carry it in my backpack in order to remind myself in the midst of interviews, photo reports, and attractive sexual propositions that we are in the country after all, or that we are to the country after the 1st of January, a Cinderella. These good people who sincerely send us a pink stiletto heel, size six and a half, imported without its mate, thinking that poor as we are, we'll accept anything, charity and alms. How can we tell all those good people that no, we no longer want to continue living in Mexico's shame? It is that part that has to be prettied up so it doesn't make the rest look ugly. No, we don't want to go on living like that. So of course, Marcos was speaking about charity, not solidarity. However, I think this is what Les was kind of getting at. Um, that's a civil society. What civil society often thinks of as solidarity is in fact charity. Now, I don't think that this means that sometimes solidarity can't also be charitable. And I don't think the Zapatistas would think that either, especially given the fact that they have at times given material aid to other struggling communities. A good example of this is back in 2006, when the Martin Luther King Center in Havana, Cuba, received eight tons of corn and 400 liters of gasoline from Zapatista communities to be distributed directly to the people suffering from the US imposed embargo. Rather, I think what Marcos and the Zapatistas are telling us here is the difference between solidarity and charity has to do with respect and dignity. That is to say, charity can be a form of solidarity so long as it's done in tandem with listening to and learning with others. To listen to and learn with is fundamentally a dignified and respectful act, whereas charity without listening, without learning, is demeaning and ultimately unhelpful. The reason why it's unhelpful is really twofold. On one hand, when you give some, you're, you're likely to give somebody something that they don't really need, much like a pink stiletto heel imported, size six and a half, without its mate. And more importantly, the act of giving, even if it's something that they actually need, does nothing to change the material conditions which caused communities to struggle in the first place. 
In other words, charity without listening to and learning with others implicitly supports the neo-colonial system of violence and the destructive, exploitative, extractive forces of integrated world capitalism. Put simply, charity supports the systems of violence that creates the need for charity. The, level to civil society, the letter to civil society, which I mentioned earlier, is reproduced in a 2003 communique, Chiapas, the 13th Stella, part two, a death. This communique teased the formations of the good government juntas by announcing the death of the Agua Calientes, and with them, the death of the Zapatistas' willingness to engage with the paternalistic NGOs. It was, in effect, a resistance to charity without solidarity, a resistance to the way in which some humanitarian NGOs actually maintain capitalism and neocolonialism through paternalistic practice. That the Zapatistas would resist this is, of course, not surprising, since the 1st of January 94, the Zapatistas have defined themselves as those who resist and rebel. In fact, I would argue that the Zapatista resistance is always primary. It's what structures the very psychosocial fabric of their world. But much like solidarity, resistance here is a word that we usually kind of throw around a lot without really thinking about what we mean. I think a good way to understand what resistance is, is to kind of start with the presumption that it has two forms, one reactive and the other active. Reactive resistance is an action that by pushing back against a force actually reinforces it. A good example here is charity. You know, it may push back against the suffering of a limited amount of people for a limited amount of time, but by locking in the unequal balance of power, it actually strengthens that same unequal system. Reactive resistance, therefore, is always defined by external forces. It exists solely within the confines of that which it resists. Reactive resistance is also determined by these external forces. It is unable to set its own agenda and carry out its own actions. Resistance groups that are only reactive are what the militant psychoanalyst Felix Guattari termed a subjected group. And I think the experience of these kind of reactive you know, resistances is gonna be really familiar to anyone who like myself has ever worked in the charity sector. On the other hand, active resistance is always creative. It's a form of resistance that's able to work outside the limitations given to it by external forces. By transgressing the limits imposed on it, active resistance is able to open up a new field of possibility. And as such, it is fundamentally revolutionary. In fact, I was going so far as to argue that revolutionary change is only possible through a never ending practice of active resistance. So you always have to kind of actively resist that which wants to close down openings, close down possibility. Active resistance produces what Guattari referred to as a subject group, a group that's able to speak for itself and determine its own project. Now calling this type of group a subject group is actually quite significant because resistance produces subjects. That is to say, we are who we understand ourselves to be, you know, our very kind of sense of self is created through the practice of resistance. And, and here I'm actually explicitly drawing on the psychoanalytic writing of Jacques Lacan. So Lacan claimed that our unconscious mind is actually structured by multiple points of resistance. So what he means by that is the way in which the patient kind of resists the psychoanalyst, you know, this is what structures our unconscious. So basically, um, when the individual is in the analytic situation, when they're in you know, kind of psychotherapy, the analyst will impose suggestions. And then the patient can either passively accept or resist these suggestions. And the con argued that the practice of resisting the analyst actually worked to produce the ego in the patient. That is to say, it produces the patient's sense of self within the unconscious mind. So it doesn't matter if the therapy is one-to-one -one or group therapy, although I can definitely attest from my own experience of group analysis that this resistance, at least for me, is much more powerful in groups. And here I should say that my thinking around groups is actually kind of drawing from my own experience in group analysis, as, as well as my experience in kind of various groups, you know, activist groups, union groups, so on. And my wager here is that many people will kind of recognize what I'm talking about from your own experiences of groups, even if you haven't really studied this. So 
when you're in a group, you know, different individuals are kind of automatically assigned roles. So, you know, this one's the quiet one, that's the chatterbox, um, he's the grumpy one, you know, so on, so on, so on. But what happens when the individuals resist being pigeonholed, when they resist with dignity and respect for the others in the group, is the group itself starts to kind of change and forms a cohesion that does not totalize. That's to say, it becomes a type of group where they're able to work together as a group, but the individual members retain their individuality. You know, they kind of retain their difference within the group. So this group does not subsume their identity and does not come to define them. Um, kind of quite interestingly, Guattari, again, I draw a lot from Guattari, Guattari in my work, but he called this group, you know, this kind of structure, a machinic assemblage. So it was machinic because the individuals work together to produce something. You know, what it is they produce doesn't really matter, to be honest. You know, it could be something really big, you know, a radical politics, a desire for revolutionary change, or something small and modest, you know, a kind of modest change in lifestyle. You know, it's not the size that matters, but rather the significance of what they're doing and that they're doing it together. You know, and this group is also an assemblage because it's arranged in such a way that it always keeps its otherness. So what I mean by that is each part of the group, each individual kind of keeps hold of their difference. They keep hold of their individual identity and their sense of self that is outside of and beyond the group. As a machinic assemblage, this group is able to speak for itself, to articulate its own desire beyond the confines of any external forces. It's also able to affect material changes in the life of the members of the group. The membership of a group like this is fundamentally defined by different intensities. So people will at times be right in the middle of the group. They'll have a very kind of intense experience and involvement of the group. And then at other times that same person might take a step back, you know, and they're still kind of part of the group, but they're not as intensely active within it. This movement from the center to periphery and back again means that the group moves and changes in a way that's not really linear. You know, it's not A to B to C. Rather, it will move in all kinds of directions and it moves fundamentally slowly. So part of the experience of this type of group is also the experience of slowness. This means it requires a willingness not to respond to capitalism's demand for both speed and efficiency. So kind of pulling it back a bit, what I wanna say is what the Zapatistas have done to politics is not different than what psychoanalysis and group analysis has done for psychotherapy. And they've done this by changing the individual in relation to the social environment. It's no coincidence that in 2003, the Aguas Calientes were born or reborn as the Calocoles or snails in English. The reason for this name is twofold. First, it has to do with the shape of the snail's shell, a spiral. Members of the community cycle through different decision-making councils, meaning that power in the community is neither vertical nor horizontal, but rather it's transversal. It's like this diagonal line that cuts across the community. When power is arranged in this way, when, when people kind of spiral into and out of these different decision-making bodies, that means your experience of, of the community is also defined by these intensities. So, you know, sometimes you're right in the middle of it, but then you kind of take a step back. Um, the second reason they're called calacoles has to do with the speed in which change happens. That's to say, change always comes slowly. In fact, one of the axioms that forms the basic tenet of Zapatismo is we walk slowly because we have a long way to go. It's quite literally change at the snail's pace. This kind of slowness is in fact revolutionary. Capitalism, especially in its neoliberal form, works through a logic of acceleration, a logic that basically can be summed up as move fast and break shit and then turn the cash into chaos. I think there's a problem with a lot of leftist groups that they often try to follow the same logic of accelerated speeds. You know, they're in a sense trying to beat capitalism at its own game. I remember after September 11th, I, I was lucky enough to see the philosopher Jean Baudrillard speak. And he said something that really struck me and, and struck me as being really similar to, to the Zapatista project. He said that when the events around us speed up, it's our duty to slow down. 
That is to say, it's our duty to resist the temptation to go fast and break shit, to take the time to think about what kind of group, what kind of machinic assemblage we need. I really think that this is perhaps the greatest lesson that the Zapatistas have given us. They've given us a map, but, but not a map that really should or even can be followed to the letter. But nevertheless, it's something that plots out a sense of how to go about creating a world in which many worlds fit by opting out of this rigged kind of capitalist game. By slowing down when people want them to speed up, by taking the time to think about what they're going to assemble and how they're going to assemble their resistance in their communities, by taking the time to analyze what's happening, by studying the material and expressive conditions and being able to adapt to changing conditions, by acknowledging and learning from their own shortcomings and their own missteps, and by frustrating absolutely everyone who wanted them to be quick, sexy, and revolutionary, they've actually created a resistance that's absolutely unprecedented in its scope and its longevity. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Anthony. I think you completely bring together the other presentations and introduce so many ideas. It was amazing. The, my head is like going full. <laughs> I have to slow down now to catch up with all the ideas mentioned today. Ay, hermano mexicano, cuánta penumbra te acecha. Ay, hermano mexicano, cuánta penumbra te acecha. El retroceso mortal, haber optado a derecha. El retroceso mortal, haber optado a derecha. Y no es que sea alternativa la izquierda domesticada. Y no es que sea alternativa la izquierda domesticada. Pero la opresión injusta pronto verás duplicada. Pero la opresión injusta pronto verás duplicada. Van a quererte imponer, vivas con resignación. Van a quererte imponer, vivas con resignación. Mientras destrozan tu patria, harán votos de oración. Mientras destrozan tu patria, harán votos de oración. Los tibones criminales vende patrias verde azul. Los tibones criminales vende patrias blanca y azul. Se pondrán sotana o botas y con Fox los verás tú. Se pondrán sotana o botas y con Fox los verás tú. Para muestra unos botones nunca debes olvidar. Para muestra unos botones nunca debes olvidar. Su arenga contradictoria, su vulgar mediocridad, su arenga fascista nazi, su vasta frivolidad. Demagogia, explotación, no desaparecerán. Represión, saqueo y abusos, no desaparecerán. Este es de la misma clase que al pueblo explotando está. Este es de la misma clase que al pueblo explotando está. Acuérdate de Paulina, violada con vil crueldad. Acuérdate de Paulina, violada con vil crueldad. Al pan diciéndolo pares, después te contentarás. No deberás abortarlo o a prisión vas a parar. El IPAP es otra infamia que no se va a destapar. El IPAP es otra infamia que no se va a destapar. Mira qué desvergonzados. Robaron un dineral y para costear su fraude todos debemos pagar. En fin, la lista de agravios es grande y más crecerá. En fin, la lista de agravios es grande y más crecerá. Pero tú qué estás haciendo? Ya deja de lloriquear. Prepárate para la lucha. Al pueblo hay que organizar. 
a estudiar conscientemente teoría revolucionaria, a estudiar conscientemente teoría revolucionaria, a actuar colectivamente con práctica proletaria, a actuar colectivamente con práctica proletaria. Si no exiges tus derechos, a pesar de mi advertencia, si no exiges tus derechos, a pesar de mi advertencia, cruzate de brazos pues y atente a las consecuencias, cruzate de brazos pues y atente a las consecuencias, cruzate de brazos pues. Y atente a las consecuencias.